Good day or good evening, depending on where you are situated. Welcome to another CAF web talk. In this series called Trivializing Jew Hatred and the Consequences, we begin today with Dr. Richard Landis, whose landmark book, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? Lethal Journalism, Anti-Semitism, and Global Jihad will open your eyes to the power of propaganda and lies that fuel Jew hatred. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, which was founded 20 years ago to bring attention to rising anti-Semitism, to educate both the Jewish and the general public about Israel and Jewish rights to the land, and to expose the lies about Jews and our history, and build alliances with other Jewish and non-Jewish organizations in the struggle to halt this hatred. We focus a great deal on combating anti-Zionism, and over the last three years have expanded our reach considerably through webinars like this. We've become visible vocal advocates for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism and for its implementation. A resolution to adopt it is insufficient. Often mere words allow adopters of IRA to sound virtuous in the Jewish community, but it is not enough. Fighting those who want to prohibit adoption is its own battlefield. We increasingly hear the accusation that the IRA definition silences the voices of Palestinians, or more ridiculously, it promotes anti-Palestinian racism. The battleground today is in the use of language, but it spills over into harassment, threats, vandalism, intimidation, it involves miseducating kids in public schools, teaching lies and bigotry towards Israel, and pushing a fake Palestinian Arab history which often uses actual Jewish history and claims it as its own. CAF confronts the journalistic lies and anti-Zionist biases in much of our media today and stands with the end Jew hatred movement in promoting direct action to bring attention to the civil rights of the Jews, which are being encroached on in this escalating campaign of disinformation and what Dr. Landis calls lethal journalism. CAF is a small organization dependent on volunteers, so if you want to make a difference, you can initiate an NGU hatred chapter. You can contribute to the advocacy issues that we present. If you have resources to support our activities, share them. Access our information at NGUHatred.com. Make a donation to CAF at www.caf.ca. Before I introduce Dr. Landis, I would like to thank today's Web Talk co-sponsors who helped to bring our programs to your attention. Beth Tikva Synagogue, Adith Israel Synagogue, the Lodger Center Congregation, the Canadian Institute of Jewish Research, Americans for a Safe Israel, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, and Jew Hatred Canada, the Matatias Project, European Lawyers for Israel, Eye on Antisemitism, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, the Stronger Together Fighting to End Jew Hatred Conference, the Israel Independence Fund, Israel Activist Calendar, Campaign for Truth, the Israel Committee of Sonoma County, ISGAP, the Institute for um, Studies on uh, Global Studies on Antisemitism and Policy, and Americans for Peace and Tolerance. If you were part of an NGO that would like to add its name to our programs, please be in touch with me. Richard Landis was trained as a medievalist at Princeton University, earning both his MA and PhD there. His work focused on apocalyptic beliefs and millennial movements, initially around the year 1000. He developed the concept of demotic religiosity, an orientation that prizes equality before the law, dignity of manual labor, access to sacred texts for all believers and moral integrity over social honor. But he increasingly focused on contemporary movements, especially global jihad and the feckless response to its challenge, starting with the coverage of the Al-Aqsa Intifada in late 2000. He made a series of documentaries in 2005-06 titled, According to Palestinian Sources, which document the extensive staging of footage for which he coined the term Hollywood. The staging of events by the Palestinian Arab media to embarrass, blame, alienate, and eventually destroy Israel. One might ask if its ultimate intent is to destroy the Jews. 
The fakery of what came to be referred to as the Muhammad al Jura incident in 2000 was presented as an IDF intent to kill a young Arab boy and is seen to be the turning point in the media's demonizing of Israel. The image of the child squatting behind his father became an icon for the Western media and hence Western academics, politicians, NGOs, and much of the progressive community have used it to turn against Israel. Melanie Phillips, a renowned journalist, in reviewing Richard's book points out that while the fakery is well known now and the epic casting of the Mohammed al Jura event was a blood libel, damning the Israelis as cold-blooded killers of a defenseless child, it has never been erased from the public record. This, along with other exaggerated mid-cast, miscast or total faked events, continue to play to a progressive leftist and jihadist view of Israel, as bad as Goliath, as the new Nazis and Palestinian Arabs, as good, hence David, is the new Jewish, are the new Jewish victims of genocide. She paraphrases Landis in saying that today's Western journalists behave like true believers in the lies about Israel. This and other significant incidents of magnified claims by Palestinian Arabs to Israeli injustices have been accepted, repeated, and even inflated by Western media and promote the public view that even a suicide bomb attack is justified as resistance against an Israeli occupation and war crimes. Richard describes this as lethal journalism. Today, the acceptance of these mythological and lethal jihadi supporting stories give rise to the global progressive left's actual injustices against Israel, including the exclusion of Jews from progressive causes, while the jihadi extremists are welcome into these circles, causing an explosion of hatred and anti-Semitism. So now over to Richard. This, just to let you know, the uh, entire webinar is being recorded. You can put your questions into the Q&A. Please be respectful. Use the chat to share information about where you are and with one another. But if you have a question for Richard, please put it in the Q&A. Richard, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I was just looking at the questions and answers, which I will try and include in my comments. Um, <clears throat> well, let me start with uh, why I wrote this book. Um, it really started in 2000 when the Intifada broke out. And at that point, I was on the board of the New England uh, American Jewish Committee, AJC. And I was on the media committee, or I joined the media committee at that point, because what was so puzzling was why the media was so intent on reporting basically the Palestinian version of events, including Adula. Uh, I didn't realize at the time that Adula was a fake. I just knew that it was an enormously powerful image that made it almost impossible to defend Israel. So I, and then James Fallows came out with an article in the summer of 2003 about the claims that this was fake. He didn't believe it was fake, but what he did affirm was that the narrative that the Israelis killed him, and certainly that the Israelis targeted him, was inaccurate, that it couldn't have happened the way the journalist, Charles Andela, had said it happened. Um, but then I went to France, and I met with the people who were working on this, and I saw the footage. And as soon as I saw the footage, it was clear to me that this had been staged, that, that you know, the, first of all, it's, it's six takes of 10 seconds each. Um, most of them are, you know, chopped up and difficult to see. And um, and so it was clear. And then I went to, to Israel in the fall and actually got a chance to see the footage of the journalist, the photographer who took the shots of Mohammed Adola and his father behind the barrel. And it was, you know, it was either people standing around right in front of the Israeli position with no fear whatsoever, throwing rocks, burning tires, and so on, or it was actually staged stuff. And after one particularly ridiculous stage scene where the guy pretends that he's been hit and then nobody gets him, so he walks away. And um, I said to Andela, this French Jewish 
Israeli who served in the Israeli army. Um, I said, this stuff looks really fake. He says, oh yeah, they do it all the time. And that's when I realized, that's when I coined the term Pollywood. I realized not only do the Palestinians fake it, but the Western press Israelis have no problem using these fakes uh, to tell their story. So that got me involved. I started doing, I did a, I did a, I did a documentary, which I had never done before, a 20-minute documentary. And the first one was on Pallywood, because when I talked to people about what happened, they'd say, look, there are five possibilities. The Israelis on purpose, the Israelis by accident, the Palestinians by accident, the Palestinians on purpose, and five. And I, uh, five, people would say, what? Um, uh, the ambulance drivers killed him, or you know, the the journalists killed him, or it, it, they could not imagine that it was staged. It was just not in the minds of Westerners that you would a have people staging something like this, and b that it would get past the Western media. And that actually led to the first uh, working title of my book, which was "They're so smart because we're so stupid." Because people would say to me, oh, the Palestinians, they're brilliant at, at, at PR. And I'd say, no, they're not brilliant at PR. In fact, their PR stinks. In fact, the stuff they put out is transparently fake. It's cheap fakes in French, de la camelotte. And, and it's our stupidity that accepts this and gives them these victories. Um, but when it came time to do the... To publish the book, I my daughters convinced me that I should not insult my audience, and I said, even though I say we, and and they said, no, you're not fooling anybody by saying we. It's clear you don't think you're stupid. It's clear you think the people that you're describing are stupid. So I looked around a long time for a title, and finally came up with the one that a lot of people tell me they really like, which is. Um, can the whole world be wrong? And that's based on two quotes, uh, one from Echad Am back in 1892, describing the Gentile response to Jews denying the blood libel in the Ukraine. And their response was, can everybody be wrong and the Jews be right? So he wrote an acute essay, acute, uh, I mean, you, uh, you got to admire these guys. I mean, they're living under the most unbelievable circumstances, and they still manage to have a sense of humor. Anyway, so he writes, he says, yeah, this is actually good news, because yes, the whole world can be wrong, and the Jews can be right. So then the second quote comes from Janine, which is the third chapter in my book, um, and it's Kofi Annan, the head of the UN, who, when the Israelis denied that they were massacring people and refused to leave Jenin until their operation was done, said, I, I, he didn't even ask the question. He said, I don't believe that the whole world can be wrong and the Jews and Israel be right. So that's sort of the theme, which is we're dealing with a situation in which, in fact, not only is the whole world wrong about the Arab-Israeli conflict, or what I call the triumphalist Muslim autonomous Jewish conflict, um, not only are they, they seriously wrong, but the consequences of being wrong are huge, not just for us in Israel, but for democracies around the world. Um, so... Uh, I decided to write the book, and what I decided is, uh, you know, actually, I've now gone back, now that the book's out, I've gone back to a work that I was working on back in the 1990s as a medievalist about the year 1000, and I decided to focus on the year 2000 for a number of reasons. Um, one, because I really do think it's a turning point. Two, because the historians that I study in the year 1000 uh, published their stuff in the 1020s, so I'm publishing my stuff in the 2020s, and I, I, I wanted to structure it around a sort of, sort of dramatic shift 
And it's a dramatic shift in a whole bunch of ways, including how people see Israel, but also what I, I don't know how many of you know this term, the Overton window, but the Overton window is essentially what describes um, sort of what's in the center and what's on the fringes. And there was a radical shift in which what was on the left fringes became mainstream and what was in the center all of a sudden became extreme right. Uh, and that's embodied in a comment by Ian Buruma in the year 2003. So we're talking about the height of the Palestinian suicide terror campaign in which they're sending teenagers to go blow themselves up in the midst of Israeli civilians, children, grandmothers, etc. cetera. Um, and at the height of that, he says, and he doesn't say it like I have to prove it or like he's, he's promoting it. He just takes it for granted that, let me see if this right, it is a litmus test of liberal, and he used the word liberal, I would have used the word progressive. It's a litmus test of liberal credentials to support the Palestinian cause. Now, that has nothing to do with what I know as liberal. And the only way it has anything to do with what I know as liberal is, and this is something that Paul Berman commented on in 2003 at the same time, the only way that can be a liberal cause is if you are so radically misinformed about what the Palestinians say to, amongst themselves, what Palestinian preachers preach from the pulpit, and then gets re-broadcast uh, on TV, Unless you're utterly ignorant of that and you project onto the Palestinians a liberal mindset in which they would never just out of pure hatred attack Jews, what you end up thinking is their bad behavior is proof of Israel's guilt. In other words, they're acting out of desperation. And their desperation is a result of the Israelis denying them what they want. Now, it is true that their desperation or their aspiration is because the Israelis deny them what they want. But what the liberal thinks is that what they want is freedom. What they want is their own nation. And as a result, Israel is denying them what Israel has. Why can't Israel let them also have a nation? And the whole framework in which this is an attempt, the Palestinian national identity is literally built on the denial of Israeli nationalism or Jewish nationalism, um, is completely absent from that point of view. So in reality, you have liberals lining up en masse. We're talking litmus test of being a liberal is to support a exterminationist anti-Semitic movement that is actually engaged in the mass murder of Jews in Israel and that has imperialist ambitions. In other words, uh, global jihad is not around because they just want their own space to breathe. Their space, their being space, their their Lebensraum is the globe, and they say it. And Hamas is right in on this, and so is Hezbollah, and none of this gets reported. Okay, so I decided I had to write about it. Um, initially, I told my wife in 2006 or seven when I first decided to do this, that, you know, it'd be easy. I'd take uh, the best pieces from my blog, put them together and send them to the publisher. Uh, and I probably should have done that. But, you know, uh, as a historian, I mean, the book has over a thousand footnotes. By the way, if you are interested in following up the footnotes, if you go to my website, richard-landis.com, and click on the link to the book, you will see a link to footnotes. All of the footnotes, are up there by chapter, and all of the footnotes have the link to the URL to the article that I'm citing, which is not the case in the book. In the book, I only gave URLs that I thought people couldn't find on their own. But here, you have immediate access to this. 
So I ended up, you know, I, I, I wrote it, it was really going well, and then I got stuck, and then I started over, and it's taken me over a decade to come out with this book. Um, and it may be too late, or it may be just right, it may be coming out just at the point where people are ready to start rethinking the folly that I document in the book. Um, so... Yeah. I tell you what, I think uh, I've talked for 20 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to lead in with a question from the last thing you just said. You talked okay. about the timing of the book. In the book, right. you write as though you're addressing it to the liberals or progressives. Are right. you getting a response from the progressives? That's my first question. And the second is, how do you explain so many Jews that from their own sense of well-being will go along with what is right. actually so dangerous for Jews? Okay, so... Um, let me answer the first question about my address to liberals. I think, I hope that, and I, I, in the introduction, I actually sort of lay out my values, which I think are liberal slash progressive. I mean, more than liberal um, in terms of positive, some actions and emotions and attitudes as opposed to zero sum ones. Um, so I, I hope to reach them, but I can't say I'm particularly optimistic about the success of that. And at least so far, the book has by and large only gotten attention in what I call the Zionist ghetto. So, you know, I, I haven't been on any sort of mainstream podcasts working on some, trying to reach Douglas Murray, trying to reach Barry Weiss, trying to reach Glenn, um, Glenn Lowry, uh, even Sam Harris, I sent him a copy of the book. So uh, who knows? But, um, but I, I, the problem for liberals is the peer pressure to line up with the Palestinian cause is so great and the resistance to the resistance to seeing the Palestinians as at fault, the tendency that Jews have to be self-critical and take upon themselves. I mean, there's a great line by um, uh, David, the playwright David Mamet, who said. Um, there's nothing more dangerous than taking, accepting responsibility for things you haven't done. And, and we do that. And we do that partly out of generosity, get the ball rolling. We'll say we're guilty. You say you're guilty. And we get on to a positive, some solution. Um, the only problem is, and this was the attitude of the Israeli left in um, the Oslo process. They wanted to bring this out. And so you had the new historians who were saying, yes, we did kick Palestinians out and so on, hoping that what that would do would be to sort of soften the anger of the Palestinians who would then say, well, yes, and we did encourage some to leave and it's a terrible situation, but let's get on with our lives. And instead it was, aha, we knew you were bastards all along and now you finally admit it. So um a lot of the sort of techniques that we have to get to positive sum, to get to yes, to get to land for peace, uh, actually backfire. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I'll be interested to see, but uh, look, when I first sent the book out, um, I sent it to a woman who was the uh, literary agent for my father, who was a well-known professor and whose books I'm still getting, <laughs> I'm still getting uh, royalties on the books he wrote. Um, the Unbound Prometheus, Wealth and Poverty of Nations, and so on. And I wrote to her and I said, I have books. She said, oh, great. Let me see what I can do for you. And I sent her the manuscript. And two days later, she sent it back and said, I can't help you. Wow. Uh, Richard, I want to go into some of the uh, concepts in your book, which is, I think... So wait, so you, you had one other question that I wanted yes, to answer. That is, how do you explain the Jews right, who... Right, so... Progressivism ...when it hurts us? So my explanation is what I call a proxy honor killing. And I'm not talking about 
sort of Jews stuck in the middle. I'm talking about the Peter Beinarts and the Norman Finkelsteins of this world. And I think that what happens, or the Tony Jutts, uh, I think what happens is that the news reports a terribly ugly image of Israel. And so that in the dynamics of honor shame cultures, when a member of your family shames the family, uh, in the really hard honor shame cultures like Arab Palestinian culture, um, you kill the daughter that shamed your family. And you do it because nobody will talk to you or let their kids marry your kids unless you get rid of this stain on your reputation. Now, Jews are too nice to kill each other, but they will join up with groups that will do the dirty work by proxy. So essentially, I think that a lot of Jews feel that Israel, they can't be proud of Israel. They loved Israel when they could be proud of it. But now that they can't be proud of it, 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 it's a stain on them and they have to. And then you get this phenomenon of as a Jew, where Tony Judd will say, as a Jew, I must condemn the, the stuff. And then people like Tony Judd, actually, he's a brilliant historian, or he was, um, they actually become an illustration of the stuff that they criticized in their book. It's really quite, quite astonishing. Okay, next question. I think, I think it's astonishing that when all the facts are in front of them, they still cling to it, especially when you mention somebody like an, um, Finkelstein, who's had decades of dealing right. with uh, facts in front of him. So let me just go to a couple of, of the scenarios that you describe of having caused us so much damage. And even I, a lay person, has known for years that these were fake, like the Aldura case. You picked Aldura as the moment in time and you focus also on Janine, which is right. always referred to as the Janine massacre, which it wasn't. Right. Right. One can also point out that what is growing, what we're seeing in Canada is an Al Quds Day and a Nakba Day. They've become big protests. So first of all, there was no Nakba either. It simply means they were defeated. There was no war the Israelis brought on anybody that means they, the catastrophe of their defeat. How, so how did you select these incidents, Janine, Aldura, I think there's a third one, I can't remember, and describe them as pivotal in the whole right. scenario looking at um, the, this conflict? Right. So let me first say something about Nakba Day, because uh, I just wrote something somewhere else about it. The Nakba, the expression the Nakba, which means catastrophe, was first coined by a Lebanese Arab to describe the catastrophe brought upon the Palestinian Arabs by the Arab leadership right. that started the war with Israel and lost it. So initially, it was an act of self-criticism. And now it's been flipped and turned against Israel. Israel's responsible for it. And this is when it gets really grotesque, you know, okay, so there were thousands of Arabs and, and over a thousand Jews, I think 10,000 Jews who died during the War of Independence. So there were tens of thousands of people who died during the War of Independence and hundreds of thousands of refugees. But this in the Arab mind is greater or certainly equal to the Holocaust, where six million people, civilians, were literally sought out in their homes and murdered. So it, it, it's grotesque. It reminds me of the Mel, Mel Brooks joke about what's the difference between uh, uh, tragedy and comedy. Uh, tragedy is if I cut my finger, or I'll cry a lot, I'll go into Mount Sinai for a day and a half. Comedy is if you fall on an open mantle and die. What do I care? So actually, they do care. They like it when we fall into an open manhole and die, and they celebrate 9-11. They celebrate every uh, terrorist attack on Israelis, including attacks on kids and so on. So, um, so the Nakba is probably one of the most interesting cases of the fake news about the past. Okay, so now you asked me, what was the question you asked? Oh, why did I choose these incidents? So 
I chose them and I, I at first I didn't have this expression, but by the end of the book, I coined uh, the term Y2K mind, Y2K being year 2000. And Y2K mind describes something that existed before, but it really sort of crystallized in the public sphere in 2000. And it does that specifically in 2000 because the, the you, you called it the Al-Aqsa Antifada, I call it the Oslo Jihad, is the first time that global jihad, which had been in the works since 1400 in their calendar, which was 1979, which is when Khomeini took over Iran and when a Mahdi pretender took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Um, so it was both Sunni and Shi'i. Uh, so that's when modern global jihad starts. But the first time that global jihad attacks a democracy is the Intifada. And the second time, which is my chapter two, is 9-11. And the third time, and, the, and then the next chapter, Janine, is about what happens when the West fights back, when democracies fight back. They're the ones who are accused of massacring the poor, innocent terrorists. Um, and then the final chapter that I chose was a chapter about uh, the Danish cartoon scandal, because it illustrated for me, I mean, it comes three or four years later, it comes in 2005, 2006. But what it illustrates is the way in which Western leadership, and here we're talking about political leaders, intellectual leaders, you name it, um, sort of thought leaders in the West, pundits, journalists, and so on, um, adopt what I call a, pre, a stance of preemptive dimitude. And preemptive dimitude, dimitude is the term that uh, designates the uh, Christian and Jewish minorities in Muslim-ruled societies. And it's a, it's a form of religious apartheid in which they have significantly fewer rights, uh, including the right to give testimony in court or to bring a Muslim to court or to criticize Islam or seem to criticize Islam and so on, to ride horses, not because you're, you're, you're in a degraded situation. You're not an honored citizen, you're a dishonored citizen. Um, so, uh, so that is dimitude. And one of the things about the history of Islam is that Vimy leaders, the leaders of the Vimy communities, the Christians and the Jews, were ex their job was to make sure that nobody in their community angered the Muslims, because once an, a Muslim felt that he or his religion or his prophet had been dissed by these minorities, he had carte blanche to do what he wanted. And so in many cases, in particular, his famous case of Maimonides, responding to a letter from Yemen about a, a messiah. And he says, you've got to get rid of this guy because it could lead to the extermination of the entire community. And that was not an exaggeration. So um, so that's Vimitude and that's Vimy leaders are there to stop criticism. And what we've had since 9-11, this Y2K mind I described, is actually a form of, of preemptive Vimitude in which the definition of Y2K mind is when jihadis attack a democracy, blame the democracy. And it started with blaming Israel for uh, the, the Intifada. And it moved very quickly to blaming the United States for 9-11. Um, immediately, the next day, The Guardian ran a piece by Seamus Milne saying, uh, don't the Americans understand how hated they are? Uh, Ten days later, Jean Baudrillard, who had visited America a great deal and considered himself the Alex de Tocqueville of the 20th century, uh, wrote a piece in Le Monde saying, you know, nobody who loves freedom cannot rejoice in this blow, 9-11, against so suffocating a hegemon as the United States. Right. The reason that this guy is not under Nazi rule is because of the United States, but we're a suffocating hegemon, whereas historically speaking, 
there has never been a hegemon with the military superiority over everybody else that has been as hands off and as uh, uh, unimperialist as America. I mean, you know, after World War II, we could have occupied all of Western Europe, and we didn't because it just wasn't in or okay. So, um, so I chose those incidents because I think that when jihadis attack the United States, attack the West and democracies, this response of blaming the West was in fact a disastrous development. And we even have, you know, sort of ex uh, jihadis who have uh, come around and they write about how, you know, they used to sit around and watch these talking heads on British TV explaining that the attack in the London subway was because of uh, British foreign policy. And they would laugh because, you know, that was a minor thing. The major thing was the ideology that they were swallowing whole and being fed on a massive scale and that the Western media wouldn't touch. They wouldn't touch it about the Palestinians and they wouldn't touch it about the jihadis. Um, so that's why I, I structured the book that way. So there are four chapters that are historical. Then there are six chapters in which I describe the major players uh, in this psychodrama, the honor shame Arabs, the caliphate or Muslims who, who believe that in this generation there will be a global caliphate, the liberal cognitive egocentrists who project their nice mentality onto people who don't share it, and as a result end up having to refuse to recognize it in people, the Israelis who do have it. Um, the progressive left, which we might talk about that later, the lethal journalists, and finally the uh, the the Jews against themselves. And then I, you know, the conclusion is where I show how these things have played out in the last 20, 20 years. You have introduced a number of very interesting concepts. Uh, one that I, I I see and and struggle with is this idea of own goal journalism. <laughs> right and maybe so two things own goal journal, journalism i'd like you to explain and elaborate and the other is uh much straight more straightforward and you've alluded to it and i'm sure most people here have a sense of it and that is fear it, how much is fear motivating the journalists to right. continue to perpetuate right. lies i mean you can't be completely blind to the truth it's sitting there in their face you know, I went on Google, you can find the Hamas charter. It, Hamas exists to eradicate right. the Jews, not just Israel. How can right. you not read that? So how right. these blinkers have to be because people are terrified already. Okay. So, uh, wait, there was one question before that. It was about... On gold journalism. Yeah, on gold journalism. Okay. Yeah. So, so I coined... Most of us know, know patriotic war journalism. It's when you pass on, as a journalist, you pass on as news, war propaganda from your own side. So famously, it was the case of the, I think, the battleship Maine in the Spanish-American War, 1898. So, and modern journalism feels very strong that their professional commitment is not to get used by the, their own government to pass on war propaganda as news. Lethal journal, war journalism is when you pass on the war propaganda of one side against another side in an external conflict. So that's Western journalists passing on Palestinian war propaganda, Muhammad Adua, Janine Massacre, you name it. Um, the list is terribly long. Um, as news. Uh, so that's lethal war journalism. But Ongo war journalism is when you pass on your enemy's war propaganda as news. And basically already by passing on Palestinian propaganda, because the Palestinian movement is not favorable to the West. It's not a friend of the West. In fact, it feels a, a great deal of solidarity with global jihad. And certainly Hamas does and Hezbollah. Um, when you so, for instance, when the news of the Jenin massacre uh, 
spread. There were huge demonstrations in the West in support of Palestinian suicide bombers, including in London and including in Madrid, where apparently I, I'd love to get a picture of this. Um, there were models who only wore two mock suicide belts and nothing else uh, to show their solidarity with people who hated them and who would soon turn this weapon against them. Madrid bombing, London, subway bombing, Paris, Bataclan, you name it. And, and so there you really have a good illustration of how people can be led. And these are not dumb people. Uh, you know, um, A.N. Wilson wrote a piece in one of Britain's most high-minded newspapers accusing the Israelis of genocide. He's not a stupid person, but he ends up lying with his own society's enemies. So that's own goal journalism. And, fear and then the other thing was fear, right. And somebody, I, I noticed at the beginning, somebody said, how do I explain why not only lethal journalists do this, but why there's no opposition. So I think I think fear is very important. It's it's sort of public secret of journalists here, which they will deny up, down, and sideways. Jody Rudorn in 2014 wrote, this stuff is nonsense, uh, this stuff about Hamas intimidation. The, the evidence was overwhelming, but who was still standing up in defense of journalists? Uh, and when asked why she did it, she said, because I think it's dangerous because it undermines our work. Yeah, it undermines your work because your work is not, it should be undermined. But in any case, so on the one hand, I think there's no question. There's a lot of fear. I, in the lethal journalism chapter, I, I talk about what happened at Ramallah, the lynch of the 12th of October. They beat a British journalist, a photographer, nearly to death, and and he uh, smashed his camera and so on. Um, and and the one crew, crew an Italian crew that uh, snuck out footage of the lynch, uh, had to flee the country. Um, and the other, the head of the other Italian uh, news agency wrote a letter to Arafat saying we would never do something like this because we are always follow the procedures for covering the Palestinian territories. And what he meant by that is what I call the Palestinian media protocols, which is Israel is bad, Palestine is good, no good news about Israel, no bad news about uh, Palestine, only good news about Palestine, and uh, only bad news about Israel, and and um, and you can see it. And I would argue, I even think this can be. Somebody had the energy. You could probably do. You could quantify this in terms of uh, what I call um, Palestinian media protocols compliance. You could have an index. And, and I think that by and large, most journalists today, including the journalists from Fox, who are under the same threats here as, as the other journalists, in fact, more, there were two Fox journalists who were kidnapped and forced to convert. Um, the, uh, the compliance would be somewhere between 85 and 95%, which is just staggering. Um, so how do we... Confronted, one of our um, attendees has said, how do we deal with the media, largely mainstream media, television, radio, newspapers, and, and reverse this? Can we? We know that Holocaust education is not having an impact. It's not reducing anti-Semitism. Right. The lies right, very strong. We all hear that Israel's PR has never been great. And I would confirm that because a few years ago, they spent a lot of money to put up pictures of pretty girls on a beach. <laughs> Tel Aviv. I don't know what that has to do with Israel's, you know, uh, peace in the world. I also have a theory, and then I'll have you answer the question. I have a theory that if for about seven days, maybe seven, maybe longer, all the media didn't report on those Israel, maybe there would be um, peace would be found because if the if our enemies <laughs> had so much coverage, maybe they would stop making so much noise. Right. Right. Um, so um, let me just do one thing before I, I answer this question, which is in the last question, I emphasized the intimidation, but I think there's another thing at work. 
And it's what I call moral schadenfreude, which is the sort of kick that you get, that, that non-Jews get, and particularly, I think, progressives get when they see Israel's name dragged in the mud. Mm-hmm. Um, news of Jews behaving badly sells. It's really popular. And news of Palestinians behaving badly, nobody wants to hear it. And news of Arabs behaving badly, when Arabs start killing Palestinians, which happens in Syria, which happens in Lebanon, nobody's interested. They're only interested when the Jews are doing it, or when it can be blamed on the Jews, even if the Jews aren't doing it. Uh, um, So uh, I think that that, unfortunately, and I have an article coming out in the journal of anti-Semitism on progressive supersessionism, um, reflects a kind of invidious identity formation, a zero-sum identity formation, where I make myself look bigger by making you look smaller. And making Israel look smaller makes progressives feel bigger. So I heard from lots of my friends, or now former friends, um, in the years after 2000, this time Israel's lost the moral high ground. And I kept asking myself, how can anybody think that Israel's losing the moral high ground to people who teach hatred and send their kids out to kill other people's kids by, by killing themselves? And I realized we hadn't lost the moral ground to the Palestinians. In fact, the progressives have a great deal of hidden contempt for the Palestinians, humanitarian racism. They expect nothing of them. And they certainly don't see them as rivals. We lost the moral high ground to the progressive left. And that's why progressives are so eager and so willing to circulate this news about Jews because it really makes them feel, they feel bigger because we look smaller. Um, Now, what was your question? Well, I think you, I think you've said, what do we do? What do we do we deal with the media in, in right. that context, is there a way? I mean, I, I don't know so, that they respond to petitions, letters. What would change that? Well, so uh, for one thing, I do think that it's terribly important to write letters all the time. This guy named Richard Sherman, who started sharing his letters with me, and I think they're great. Yeah. I uh, I've I published many about. of them, so I, and he's here today. So thank you, Richard. Oh, Sherman. is he? Okay, well, thank you, Richard. I, I really enjoy that. So, but in any case, Um, I I do think letter writing is terribly important. I personally think that every single major newspaper, Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, you name it, uh, is uh, USA Today, um, and so on, NPR, needs a shadow organization. The, The camera started one Actually, somebody else started one, and then they joined camera. Adam Levick started one called, uh, initially it was, um, I forget the name of it, but it, it was, he was he was watching The Guardian and criticizing The Guardian. Now it's UK Media Watch. Um, and, and he did a fabulous job. And I think that it's important that this stuff get tracked and criticized so that when somebody reads you know, somebody like my sisters in Philadelphia who vote for for Joe Biden and voted for Obama and they love Israel, but they really, you know, I think they're by and large mostly prisoners of, of Y2K mind. Um, when they read something negative about Israel can check and say, okay, Washington Post, I'm going to Washington Post watch and see what they say about this article. And I do think that that can have a significant influence, certainly on Jews and their motivation in dealing with this. Because one of the things that happened in 2000, 2001, 2002, that led to the as a Jew phenomenon, the Tony Judd stuff, uh, you know, Israel's causing anti-Semitism. Um, not, not Palestinians and, and Muslims are causing anti-Semitism, we should say something like that, um, was that there were the Jews who were deeply shamed by the depiction of Israel in the media really didn't have the tools to doubt the media. I mean, it's like, you know, my parents have been lying to me. I I can't believe that they would lie to me. 
I can't believe that the media would across the boards report a Janine massacre that never happened and not correct themselves. No, that can't be. So rather than say Israel lining up people and massacring them and then, you know, using bulldozers to cover their bodies. No, that can't be. No, <laughs> what can be is that. The, so I do think that it's terribly important. The other thing is there are really good bloggers out there. Um, Elder of Zion, um, Israeli cool, um, uh, Jonathan Hoffman in um, in England and stuff. They do enormously good work and they deserve support. And and they don't. I mean, you know, somebody like Elder of Zion is such a precious yeah. resource that he should be running an office with 20 people. And he does it in his spare time. And in fact, he's anonymous because he doesn't want his employer to realize how much time he spends on this blog rather than on his job, which he does anyway. Um, the well, employer is, there, know, right? is there a failure of the Israeli government because they're not oh. putting stuff out and, and have they read your book? Has anybody in their media oh. office read your book? Listen, I haven't broken into the Israeli media. I've spoken to two journalists, neither of whom have actually published articles about me. Um, the Israeli government... Every once in a while, they sort of wake up and say, oh, we got to do something about this. But rather than gathering people like me and, and Gerald Steinberg and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Itamar Marcus and all the people who have been engaged in this cognitive war against uh, the Palestinians and their propaganda, instead of gathering us together in a room and saying, what do you suggest and how can we organize you and how can we, it's all we know what to do. Like, we'll show pictures of hot babes in in On Israel, right? Right. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I think I mean I just spoke about this to my class at ISCAP. Um, I, I think one of the problems is that Zionism was supposed to put an end to anti-Semitism, and by and large, Israelis living in Israel know they have enemies named the the Palestinians. But they don't really think that there's a serious problem of anti-Semitism in the rest of the world. And when in 2000 you had this wave of hatred um, sweeping through the Western world, sweeping through progressive circles in the Western world, liberal litmus test, when that happened, very few of them were able to really understand what was going on. And, you know, you, you understand the Israelis... Their focus is on winning the, the, the kinetic war, not the cognitive war. And they feel that as long as they continue to win the kinetic war, the military activity, then, you know, whatever happens in the cognitive war, they don't really care. And then every once in a while they wake up, but they don't really know and they're not really equipped to understand what's going on. And one of the people in my class pointed out that, in fact, the split between diaspora Jews and the Israelis is to some extent uh, a reflection of the fact that, you know, the cognitive war has been devastating to Jews in the diaspora. And the Israelis, who, at least in the minds of anybody who believes what the media reports, is responsible for this, don't seem to care. And I, and I think that that's a very serious problem. So that leads to two questions, but first is um, a little bit different. Um, Daniel Pipes talks about Israel as having to declare victory. You're probably familiar yeah. with this concept. Yeah. He also says um, radical Muslims are the problem, moderate Muslims are the answer. So right. your, your book, you describe the fact that lethal journalists and jihadists are together and being against um, everybody, well, basically being the woke generation, um, they're in favor of the Palestinians who are considered people of color and the Jews are considered white. Moderate Muslims are being murdered by jihadists and this is being ignored. Is there a possibility of Jews and quotes, moderate Muslims working together to confront these lies and this hatred? Well, look, there are. I mean, there are people like um, 
uh, what's to, to Ian Hirsi Ali and right. stuff who uh, who are perfectly willing to um, join with the uh, Zionists to fight this. And there are people like. Um, well, in Canada, we have Muslims facing tomorrow with Rahil and Sohel Raza. But these are just individuals. What about exactly. I mean, on a, on the scale of jihadism with the number of people being attacked? How do you reach that? maybe 40 percent 30 percent or whatever of the muslims who who don't want this to be happening in their name all right so before i answer that i just want to say i see there are 99 comments in the chat and yeah. 30 in g plus a can you say we, we will be saving them, them, send them to me right yeah, I'm really interested. Happy right to do and, and of course we're going to meet again on tuesday so we can right. we can and i'm i'm hoping that we get to i'm trying to incorporate some of the questions people are sending uh, okay good so um so first of all we have a problem and that is we have no idea and dan pipes is clear on this uh we have no idea who's a moderate muslim um, because there are plenty of people who in English will say, you know, Tariq Ramadan is sort of the perfect example of somebody who comes off as moderate. But uh, if you listen carefully, no. Right. Um, so there's a problem of false moderates. And we, you know, the rabbis tell us that we should, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt and see other people in a favorable light. And so we're reluctant to be, how should I say, suspicious. Critical? Um, confrontative? It's certainly confrontational. So, and, and that's part of this, this uh, preemptive dimitude. Um, so on the one hand, there's that problem. On the other hand, you know, somebody like Zudi Jasser, he's the guy I was thinking of. Zudi Jasser is an American raised Muslim. He's a, uh, an officer in the army. He's a doctor. He's a genuinely modern, Mus moderate Muslim who after 9-11 tried to rally his fellow Muslims to demonstrate in the streets against what happened. No. Right. No. no. Now, it isn't that there weren't a bunch of Muslims who would have. It's that their leadership, which had been systematically shifting since 1400 slash 1979, because the Saudis were sending out people to radicalize mosques throughout the West, um, the leadership put heavy pressure on people not to do it. And with George Bush giving a speech, and I, that's one of the one of the main points I make in my chapter on 9-11 with George Bush making a speech four days after 9-11 saying Islam is a religion of peace and Muslims all over the world are as appalled at this as we are. That was basic disinformation. That was not the situation around the world. A major theme from the Obama administration. Right. And so, you know, the Obama administration, we can't talk about radical Islam. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, if you want the argument that people like Hillary Clinton made and, and John Kerry made, uh, I mean, it was wonderful to hear John Kerry tell us what true Islam is. Um, uh, the arguments that they were making and Obama made is don't use the word radical Islam because you will alienate moderate Muslims who will then join the jihadis. Now, just before that, they told you Islam is a religion of peace and it has nothing to do with the jihadis. But if you denounce the jihadis, you're going to drive the moderates who have nothing to do with them into their arms. What's striking about that is that on the one hand, you're not talking about anything that's critical of Islam, but the media is constantly sending the world pictures of Israelis killing Palestinians and Palestinian suffering. And in the Western mind, this is about a national conflict. But in the, in the mind of Muslims looking at these pictures, this is infidel slaughtering Muslims. There was nothing more likely to confirm the jihadi narrative that the West wanted to destroy Islam than the lethal journalism that covered the Arab-Israeli conflict. That 
nobody had a problem with, but they had a problem with talking about radical Islam. And so you're sort of, it's, you're hit from both sides. You're, you're feeding the beast and you can't talk about the beast. Right. And if you do, and I imagine you've experienced this, you're a racist and you're an Islamophobe and those are Absolutely. certainly really bad brands to have on your forehead. Yep. yep. Right? Yep. So Richard, Absolutely. many more questions. It's a very lively um, topic. It's very timely. It's this book actually is, a, I think, an eye opener. I hope it does more. I hope it will motivate people. Those of you who are in Toronto, you should know that Richard will be here next week and he will be speaking at the Bayat on the 10th. So the Bayat is the um, Beth Avraham Yosef Synagogue. Right. Um, and, um, and I know everybody is welcome. And, um, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, Richard. I will see you on Tuesday. And thank you everyone for participating. There'll be a little slide that goes up to thank our sponsors again. And I wish everybody a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity.